Kensington Town Hall, designed by Sir Basil Spence, built in 1977, and venue this week of the NFU AGM. More on the AGM in a moment. In part two, I shall be talking to the world's biggest turkey farmer, Bernard Matthews, about, amongst other things, the sort of national aids he's been offered to set up business in France. But the main event of the week was the NFU's AGM. And after the recent government white paper figures showing that farmers' incomes have dropped by 24% in real terms, I suppose it was predictable that this year's AGM would be rather a depressing event. This was to be especially true in the livestock debates, which dominated the two-day meeting. The gulf between horn and corn was much in evidence, and there were no resolutions at all on cereals or sugar beet. With Richard Butler very much part of the relatively well-to-do east of England, it was also clear that this was going to be a difficult AGM for the President himself. But Tuesday morning began bright and clear as delegates gathered at the unfamiliar location of the supermodern Kensington Town Hall. The new town hall was a far cry from the old venue at Westminster, but the spacious, pleasing surroundings did little to hide the feelings of the farmers themselves. As the delegates arrived, it was clear that the poor performance of their industry was foremost in their minds. For some, the causes were all too clear. All our expenses, fertilizers, uh, fuel is a terrible, that's gone sky high, and that's, uh, that's something that uh, our present earnings is not meeting, and I, I think we haven't seen the worst of it yet. The sector which promised to cause the biggest stir was milk. Richard Butler, union president, had been reported in the press recently as proposing cutbacks in production, a source of great concern to a Yorkshire contingent. I think that disturbed us a great deal, those remarks that he made. And uh, it's very worrying indeed that in a situation where we're a deficit country for milk and dairy products, that he could really say that and really open our door to foreign uh, imports, which we suspect are, su are subsidised in some way. I mean, when you look at the French and the Germans who are expanding at a, a frightening rate, and we end up by sort of helping them to pay for their surpluses. And I think the remarks that Richard Butler is uh, reputed to have said uh, are going to uh, worrying milk producers a great deal. Well, that issue was indeed to come out later, but inside the hall, as delegates settled in their seats, Richard Butler rose to bring the meeting to order. It has been a difficult year. Bank a surgical collar supporting a slipped disc he'd suffered earlier in the week didn't appear to distract him as he reminded delegates of the dismal plight of their industry and the bleak times to come. Many of their income problems, he said, lay in Europe. But he hastened to add the solutions could be found there too. Now the first step towards a recovery from our potentially disastrous farm income situation lies in Europe. Together with the other farm organisations, we have, through COPA, asked for a 15.3% increase in common farm prices. The second area in which we have to look in order to try and correct the situation is to strongly oppose revaluation of the green pound. We have done so up to now and we will continue to do so. We cannot accept that our farmers should receive less than the average price increase, and that is what a revaluation would mean. Those points are our policy for the future. It is one which we must prosecute together. It is one for which I shall continue to fight with all my strength. If we fail, the outlook is bleak. If we can convince government, this will be to the benefit of consumers, producers, and the nation. Thank you very much. The morning's business got underway with debates reiterating the industry's generally poor financial position. Proposer of the first motion, Roy Welford from Yorkshire, demanded something should be done to narrow the gap between incomes and costs. He clearly thought the government had a part to play. We are constantly being told to improve our marketing and tighten our belts. Sir, I see no indication in the public sector of better marketing or belt tightening. Absorbing costs by increased efficiency appears to have bypassed British Rail, the Gas Council, and the Central Electricity Generating Board. Their increased... <laughs> their
Their increased efficiency comes in the form of increased prices. Now, sir, it is our turn. Understandably, there was some keen debate on this opening issue with strong opinion on the extent of the problem and where to lay the blame. John Lay from Devon County Branch expanded on the theme. So the forecast net income for the industry for 1980 is £1,025 million. Pounds. That worked out between the 250,000 working farmers is only about four thousand a year, four thousand a year, sir. Now that is a damn sight less than some of us are paying cowmen and stockmen, and we work about twice the hours in a year to do it. How many other workers in any industry would work for under a pound an hour? They would be on strike. We can't go on strike, and one of our biggest growth costs is interest rates. There are signs that it's coming down at present, but it's not coming down anywhere near fast enough. <laughs> there was an undercurrent of feeling all round the meeting that if something could be done about lowering interest rates, the industry might just begin to see some light at the end of the tunnel. Raymond Beer from Dorset County Branch reflected on what was happening abroad. Having spent some time last year investigating agriculture in France, I think it would be a good point that at headquarters we once again take a look at this question of the subsidised interest rates that are available through Credit Agricole to the French farmer. Now, I don't criticise it, but my word, there's a lot to be offered in various forms for farmers who, in fact, have financial difficulties in France. The cost of our bank borrowings at the moment are £500 million per year. We have to pay that before we make profits. The motion, calling for a substantial cut in interest rates, received unanimous support. Okay. I don't think there's anybody not voting, so that is carried unanimously. Later, Richard Butler was to write on behalf of delegates to Mrs Thatcher, effectively bypassing Peter Walker in the process, to ask for a substantial reduction in interest rates. Also in his demands were adequate increases in support prices and no revaluation of the green pound. Mr President, Later, discussion returned to issues closer to home. A recent announcement that talks are to be resumed on tenancies this month between the CLA and NFU spurred Anthony Hall from Beckles in Suffolk to put in a plea for the tenanted sector. He began by outlining the problem. Over the last ten years, the number of farms becoming available to new tenants has fallen dramatically. And with, it, and with the sale of many county council holdings, it is now practically impossible for a young person with limited capital to start their own farming business. This is a poor reflection on this great industry that it now has no room for so many of its younger generation. In the past... Mr Hall went on to say he saw real dangers in a declining let sector for rural communities as a whole. He called for a revision in the way rents are negotiated and some kind of assurance that succession laws would remain. Mr President, we fully appreciate the complexity surrounding these issues and the social and political considerations involved, but the preservation of the tenanted sector and the traditional first step in the farming ladder is of paramount importance to this industry. We urge the National Farms Union, the County Landowners Association and Government in the strongest possible terms to find an acceptable, lasting solution before it is too late. There are two other things also, Mr. President, that we think are quite important, things that have been mentioned today, and that is the way that arbitration tribunals are set up and organised. We feel that this isn't being done to our advantage as tenants any longer. We feel that as tenants, we're up against it to a certain extent, and that our position has been um, reduced over the years, and that we're now in a very difficult position. I'm afraid to say that young people today are totally disheartened at the seemingly little movement that has been done by both the CLA and the NFU to resolve this situation. So I hope that the NFU and the CLA will go to the government in the very near future, may I say, with a package that will encourage landlords to let more land. The president had little news on the talk so far, except to say that both the NFU and CLA were still pursuing some form of term tenancy agreement. He was keen to assure delegates, though, that existing tenancies would not be affected. 
The long-awaited milk debate centred around two resolutions, one expressing hostility to paying EEC levies on surplus production when Britain is less than self-sufficient in milk, and the other deploring the widening gap between farm gate and retail prices. The situation we find ourselves is something of our own doing. How many of you have gone out of retailing milk? Not by the hundreds, but by the thousands. And then you turn around and complain the other fellow's making too much money. Well, the answer, get back in in the action. <laughs> we should get back in individually and collectively. We have a milk marketing board. Let it market. It is time the board, maybe not the whole hog, but took over the bottling and the wholesale plants. And make no mistake, if they don't do it, there are others across the water who will and are doing it. The Irish have And the delegates' criticisms didn't stop at the MMB. Many speakers addressed themselves directly at Richard Butler. There are, sir, in our area, many milk producers who are wholly dependent on this commodity uh, for our living, and that includes myself. I don't want to dwell on, on your unfortunate medical condition, uh, but I thought that it might have been some irate milk producer uh, that had tried to hang you uh, because of your suggestion that British milk production should be cut back and that milk producers should no longer try uh, to increase our self-sufficiency in milk in order to avoid the distasteful measures to tax increased production. Sir, you addressed our annual general meeting at Crewe some fortnight ago. I said at that time I was worried about the communication in this industry. And I'm more than worried at the gulf that exists between headquarters of the NFU and Thames Ditton of the Milk Marking Board with the reality the reality on the farm where the milk is produced, where the family labour is involved in fetching this milk from these cows and putting it to the wagon that takes it away. When you look, have you ever thought to look at your milk board costings or any other costings done this last 12 months and to inform your dairy membership the board's members as well, that 20% are likely to be out of business inside this next 18 months if we continue in this present way. 20% of your membership in dire straits or out of business. Read milk board costing, read ICI costing, read BOCM costing. The facts are there. If I may, sir, I would like to quote you again. And that is what you said only yesterday morning, that livestock breeding herds, except sheep, have been steadily reduced in the recent years. If this is correct, and I'm sure it is, this must mean that we are going to inevitably produce less milk in the future. This inevitably means that we will re be able to retain less of our own market. And this inevitably means that the, for the EC producers will take a larger share of our own market. And it must be to the detriment of the British milk producer if this happens. It may well be, sir, that you're shaking your head because your neck itches because of the... <laughs> because of the unfortunate condition you're in. But that is my firm belief, and at least I have a right to hold a belief. It is not in the best interest of milk producers in this country to lose their market. We have to look to the future. It may well not be financially the time to talk about expanding our market. But I sincerely and honestly believe that we have our right to our own market and it is up to us to retain and fight for it. And unless we prepare to do this, we will be like the fishermen and engulfed with quotas. Thank you very much, Mr. President. This year's AGM had its fair share of gloom and despondency, but out of that, a certain enthusiasm seems to have grown a noticeable desire not to accept the inevitable. I've been doing a great deal. I spoke with Richard Butler after the meeting to discuss his plans for the future. But first, I put the question to him. Was he in favour of a milk production cutback? Um, so far as milk is concerned, I think we've got to face the facts. First of all, we're in the community. Secondly, there is overproduction in the community. And we've got to see a, a bringing down, a stopping of that overproduction. 
Now, we haven't got overproduction in this country. We have only got a production in 1980 roughly similar to 1979. So milk producers as a whole have not wanted to expand. They've wanted to remain static. Now, if we can maintain that level over the next year or two, try to see the milk producers in other countries of the EEC reduced, maintain our position, strengthen it if possible, then we can have the chance to expand. That's what we've got to do. But are you saying in the short term at least that self-sufficiency is pretty well impossible? In the short term, yes, we've got to stand still, not reduce, and I would underline not reduce, but stand still, consolidate, and then be prepared to move off again when the whole um, climate changes. Now, the solution to many of these problems, uh, not least which the livestock problems, seems to be in Europe, and uh, Peter Walker is going to be over there at the price review. What are you going to be pressing him for at those uh, price negotiations? Well, basically, an average increase of 15.3% in common prices. Um, I would think that there should be a little bit more on livestock, perhaps a little let, bit less on cereals, but the balance is a difficulty. There should be no revaluation of the green pound because that would reduce that common price increase. And we've got to see our government taking action to either stop or match national aids being given by other governments because this is distorting the whole CAP just now and we cannot operate on that basis. You mentioned national aids there. What evidence have you actually got that this is happening over on the continent? No, very clear evidence. The um, French government have just given £410 million to their farmers. We believe that at least half of it is out with the common agricultural policies regulations, which means that that's illegal. Uh, the other half may be legal, it may not. But if the French give that sort of money to their farmers, which is equivalent nearly to the total budget of our minister and our ministry for agriculture in this country, then we must have something to match it. Richard Butler, who I'm sure feels well pleased at getting through the AGM relatively unscathed. Anyway, on Wednesday he was re-elected, as were the other principal office holders. The new venue in Kensington Town Hall received general approval from the delegates with one big reservation. Sound quality throughout the two days was appalling. And if the NFU is to return there next year, they're going to have to do something about that. One other sad and significant note, there wasn't a single woman speaker this year. Whatever happened to the Women's Farming Union? On the political front, the word from Brussels is that the Commission's price proposals, which are due to be unveiled next week, are said to include an average price increase of 8%, about half what COPE is demanding. No doubt there's a battle to come there, just as there is over the legality of those French national aids to agri agriculture. More on that in part two in a couple of minutes. The 1600cc Subaru MV. It's the best four-wheel drive value on the farm. Ask anybody who owns one. If you're a sugar beet farmer, here's good news. You can now control all these weeds and more for under £18 an acre with Merbitol a pre-emergence herbicide from Murphy. At under 18 pounds an acre, overall spraying with Merbitol can work out cheaper than band spraying. Merbitol brings your weed problems down to size. Merbitol from Murphy. Something big has happened to Mars. It's got more milk, more glucose, more sugar, and more thick, thick chocolate. How did we do it? Simple. We made it bigger. A Mars a day helps you work, rest, and play. Now, hoegrass can kill your wild oats for around £7 an acre. That's autumn hoegrass from the Herksters. Ask your distributor about the new recommendation. If black grass is your problem, there's a black grass killer that safely protects every variety of winter wheat and winter barley. Aralon. You can spray Aralon in the autumn, or you can use it just as effectively in the spring. One product for all seasons, now recommended for low volume application. And don't forget its control of wild oats and broad-leaved weeds. Aralon from the Herksters. The one you know kills black grass in all varieties of winter wheat and winter barley. Are your cereals threatened by black grass, grass weeds and broad-leaved weeds? Dosaflow will deal with them and those difficult weeds like cleavers and sterile brome. 
Dosaflow is an easy to use solution that needs no pre-mixing and you can use it on many new high yielding varieties. A clean crop means high yields. Get Dosaflow to solve your wheat problems this season. See the latest computers and other business equipment at the Bedford Business Show, Bunyan Centre, Mile Road, Bedford, next Wednesday and Thursday. Do you have bulb onion storage problems? Rheinsberger Rocky is the answer. For details, telephone Samuel Yates at Spalding or head office Macclesfield. <laughs>